Hello, and welcome to Pure Malt TV, the instant innovation series. In today's episode, we will be focusing on premium pilsners. Before we get started, I would like to invite you to make use of the questions and answers function in the Zoom webinar platform. You can find this at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar. We are predominantly a lager drinking culture with a growing preference towards this beer style. Draft lager volumes increased by 15.3% from 2018 to 19, and packed beers of the same style similarly grew by 5% in the same period. There's an emerging trend towards session strength amongst all beer styles, but 50% of the younger demographic between 18 and 34 years claim only to be drinking premium lagers. The words traditional and premium lead the way in product positioning, with 16% of new products developed in the lager category favoring these terms in 2019. Let me now hand you over to our domain expert on this category, Mr. Ruslan Hoffman. Ruslan is presenting to you again from Berlin this week, and he will take you through the various techniques accessible to brewers to premiumizing bottom fermented beer styles. Thank you, Ross, and hello again from Berlin. And as Ross already mentioned, today we will have a look on four different possibilities to influence the profile of a pale lager. This will be the use of specialty malts. Uh, we will have a look on different hopping techniques. We will discuss yeast strain selection and fermentation parameters. And last but not least, we will have a look on the use of refined malt extracts especially at the late stage of the beer production. Another factor that is missing is water chemistry, but as this one belongs uh, or depends a lot on your water treatment capabilities on place, I would like to skip it for today. As I said before, the use of specialty malts can be an important parameter to distinguish between different beer categories. So, for example, stout or wheat beers are very different from pale lagers because of their malt bill. But also within the category of premium lager, specialty malts can be used to create a specialty beer within this category. For example, a premium pilsner, a Vienna style beer, or maybe some amber lager. The specialty malts, depending on which, can be used to increase the color, increase mouthfeel, bring in certain malt-derived aroma characteristics, or help to enhance the foam stability. If we look into a classic Pilsner beer, then it can also help to bring in a certain decoction character, although you are using an infusion meshing. Base malts are usually killed at about 80 degrees Celsius and the other malts from the more basic range like Vienna malts or Munich malts have a certainly or a little bit higher kilning temperature up to 100 degrees Celsius which gives them a certain roasted characteristic, a bit of nutty flavors and a little darker color but it still leaves them with high enzymatic activity, which makes it possible to add them up to 100% in your malt bill. Nevertheless, you should be aware of that the higher kilning temperatures result in a certain loss of extract and therefore lowered brew house yields. If we look into caramel or also called crystal malts, then we need to understand that there is a so-called in-kernel mashing process uh, taking place to liquefy the starch and make low molecular sugars available for later caramelization within the kernel. Caramel and crystal malts are available from very light colors, around 30 EBC up to about 400 EBC, and those coloring is usually done by a certain roasting. This roasting has to be homogeneous to ensure that you get the best quality, which is unfortunately not always the case and quite difficult to achieve sometimes. Another type of specialty malts that can be interesting to distinguish your beer and make it premium are melanidine and brown malts, which also need a high modification, in this case, a special of proteins and elevated kilning temperatures to allow the formation of melanoidines in the process of kilning. Those malts actually bring in some nutty and biscuit-like flavors and are often used to get red colors into your final beer. 
If we look at the pros and cons, then obviously all these malts can be used in a standard brew house equipment. So you don't have to change anything in your brew house to achieve a very unique recipe resulting in a unique beer. But as I already mentioned, not always and everywhere specialty malts in this high quality are available. And once you decide to go for them, you may need a special silo for your specialty malts, special handling to avoid cross-contamination with your regular beers and malts, and maybe even a special mill is necessary, which would increase your investment costs. And last but not least, uh, you still have to look out for the minimum batch quantity of your brew house, and therefore you are limited with the smallest size of the brew that you're gonna achieve. The next technique we want to look at is hopping. And of course, you know, unfortunately in the last 10, 20 years, hops have gotten again, very popular and are not just considered uh, alpha acid deliverance. Um, if we look at them, of course, the aromas that they bring in and the new breedings that have been out, the new flavor hops uh, have a, had a huge impact on new product development. And by far, not only the craft brewers are looking here into new flavors and into new beer styles, or at least bringing new nuances into existing beer styles. Within the craft brewing trend, we still see that they are going back from the higher alcohol beers to more or less regular alcohol beers like pale lagers, like pilsners and similar beers but still they want to use innovative hopping techniques, for, exa for example, the use of single hops or the use of late and even dry hopping to get a very unique result, often referred to as IPLs if dry hopping is used. For the premium brands and especially the premium Pilsner and Lager beer style, still noble hop varieties like the Zatzer from Czech or the Hallertauer from Germany are very popular with those classic beer styles. And for the bitterness, it is often wished that those premium pilsners are a little bit higher in bitterness, but they also have a very harmonious bitterness. Therefore, it should be kept in mind that just looking at iso-alpha acids and bitter units may not be enough. It is often considered that humulinones, polyphenols, or parts of the hard resin fraction also bring in substances that may need not be directly measured in HPLC, but they contribute to a very harmonious bitterness. This has to be achieved by sufficient boiling of these hop components. As we already said, IPLs or dry hop lagers are also a trend that was, has become very popular in our recent years. Here, of course, the use of dry hopping techniques as they are common with pale ales can be just substituted to the lagers and therefore bring in a lot of different aromas coming from those varieties that have been breeded new or have been used again after they almost have been forgotten in the past. If dry hopping itself is too difficult, it is of course also an option to use aroma oils, which can add, be added in a very late stage up down to the filtration to get a unique hop flavor profile into your final beer. As with the specialty malts, if you're using regular hop products, it is very easy to implement them in your brew house, be it for a better bitterness or a more harmonious bitterness or being at for, for a late dosage for a nicer aroma. And so the use of standard equipment is no problem if you adjust your recipe here. Still, you can get a very unique recipe. And for example, if you're using it with a single hop variety, it can be nicely used then also for branding your specialty beer. The demand and supply of especially those rare or popular varieties can of course be a problem, especially if you see an increasing demand for one of these beer styles. Some of those varieties are not that much available, maybe not yet, but of course here contracts with the growers have to fulfill then later your demand in the future. On the other hand, as already said, and as we have all seen it with some of these <coughs> IPAs and pale ales in the, uh, in the recent past, some varieties get that much popular that they're in so excessive use that you might want to think about something else if you want to be different from a lot of the other brewers around you. 
for dry hopping, if you're not using it for ales already, you then may have to invest into some special equipment. And of course, the same as with the ales, dry hopping does lead to certain increase of your losses during beer production. As the next part, we now want to look into fermentation. And here on the one hand, we look into the yeast strains and on the other part, we look into actual fermentation technology. Um, as you know, fermentation is the main part for biotransformation of word ingredients into the molecules and aroma active substances that we can find in our final product beer. Uh, but the quality of fermentation is not only limited to aroma profile, it affects turbidity, foam stability, and also mouthfeel of the final beer. Therefore, it is, of course, a very powerful tool to differentiate your beer profile and to make yourself a premium brand that is unique on the market. If we look into the yeast strains, then during the last decades, many in-house yeast strains have been um, cultivated and further selected to performing best in the brew house and also the available yeast strains from uh, bigger yeast banks or also from dry yeast have improved a lot in the last decades. The classic profiles that we are usually looking for are a good fermentation speed and depending again on the beer style, low or higher final attenuation. Obviously we're looking to a fitting aroma profile, maybe even a unique aroma profile. Talking about Pilsner beers, certainly we have to mention the capability of producing and reducing diacetyl Diacetyl, if you want to keep it to a more Czech style Pilsner, is something you want to have in your beer. If you're sticking to a German Pilsner, it should be below the flavor threshold. Other parameters that we have to look for when selecting the yeast are flocculation behavior, SO2 production for a good oxidative stability, and also stress resistance, as well as genetic stability, especially if we're looking into repitching the yeast several times. The latest research does not only look in our, to our classic in-house yeast strains or just at Sacramurtsis pastorianus for the lager yeast. It also looks into hybrids from Sacramurtsis oibayanus, for example, or also from even non sacramurtsis yeast strains to create even better performing yeasts and new aroma profiles. I think a lot of this work looks really promising and I'm really, really looking forward to the future, what comes up there next. But as I said before, next to the yeast strains themselves, the fermentation technique also has a high impact on the resulting flavor. So first of all, temperature and pressure do uh, um, correlate with a certain amounts of, for example, esters or higher alcohols. The design and dimensions of your fermentation vessels are playing a role here. Also the type of lager tank that you're using horizontal versus a CCV aeration rate, one tank versus two tank procedure, all these parameters obviously influence the flavor profile and can be selected or adjusted to the wishes that you actually have. One last point I would like to mention here, of course, most of the lager beers nowadays on the market are filtered, but maybe it is also interesting to look into an unfiltered Keller beer style, for example, or even use bottle conditioning for a classic premium or lager beer to make it special and therefore unique on the market. Plus and minuses of the fermentation and of uh, the yeast strains are mentioned here. Of course, there is a huge, it seems even unlimited availability of different yeast strains from the yeast banks in Berlin, Munich and Belgium in the UK and wherever. But well, most of these yeasts, of course, they need and you have certain capabilities in your lab or propagation plant to bring them into the amount that you can actually pitch for your regular production and therefore um, it might be not too easy, especially for the smaller brewers, to use all of these varieties and strains that are, that are available on the market. Once you have them in the necessary amount for pitching, then the use in a standard brewer house design is absolutely no problem. And therefore, they can be a very powerful tool to creating unique aromas and flavors for your beers. 
On the other hand, of course, the more specialty beers you produce from specialty strains, the more you have to look out for the proper handling of those yeast, propagation, management, and so on, and the higher will be the risks of a possible cross-contamination between the different strains and then mixing up the flavors and the profiles of your beers. Well, as already said, there uh, is a huge amount of yeast strains available, but to be honest, most of them are not mass market ready. And if we are looking onto the yeast strains that are actually available for the mass market, then we have three to five strains that are actually in use. So being unique with those fives can be a bit difficult, except of course for fermentation parameters that we had a look at. Last but not least, let's have a look at refined malt extracts, which are made from the same raw materials as beer is. And they are also as well processed in a traditional brew house. The refined malt extracts can of course be used in the brew house, for example, as, a, as an additive to your word production already there, but they are also very effective in adjusting flavor and color during a later stage of your production, for example, post fermentation. Most lager beers are filtered, therefore the addition of a refined malt extract should be done before filtration at the latest. And although malt extracts are made traditionally from the same raw materials, they are not brewed in your brew house, in your brewery. But on the plus side, the high proportion of specialty malts and the extraction process make refined malt extracts highly consistent in flavor and color, and therefore, ideal for even adjusting small batches without that they have to fit your brew house capacity. The slight adjustment makes it possible to bring a beer back into your specs without investing or without refining it again through the whole brewing and fermentation process. They are highly flexible and also for new product development, it is really easy to use those malt extracts, but this will be showcased now by Simon and this is where my part ends. And I thank you very much for listening and back to you, Ross. Thanks very much, Ruslan, for your very interesting presentation on the different techniques available to brewers to premiumizing bottom fermented beers. I'm now delighted uh, to be taking you guys over to a live stream of my colleague, Simon Turner, uh, who is in the new Pure Malt Distribution Center and has a, a product showcase of some of the solutions available from Pure Malt for premiumizing pilsners. Simon, over to you. Yes, thanks Ross. So you join us here in the new warehouse and uh, today we're looking at premium pilsners uh, and I'm gonna be showing you just a few of the products from within the Pure Malt range uh, that can help you elevate an existing lager um, and create your own unique premium pilsner brand. So we have uh, three products uh, to show you today. Um, this will enable us to head off in slightly different directions, but the overall objective is the same. Um, we are looking to differentiate and premiumize uh, by bringing in elements of uh, color, sweetness, complexity of flavor, body, and mouthfeel. So before we move on to the demonstration, there are just a few things to mention. Um, as with all of the webinars within the Instant Innovation Series, a recording will be available. Um, so if you don't have everything you need in front of you now, don't worry, you can watch on demand uh, and prepare the samples in your own time. Uh, to conduct the tasting, you will need seven glasses or sample cups. Uh, you will need your pure malt product samples. Um, you will need a basic set of scales like the ones I have here. Uh, and you will also need um, a couple of bottles of a pale crisp lager to use as your base. You can, of course, use any Pilsner that you may have available. It's just that with a, a pale light lager, you can really uh, see the impact, uh, the taste and see the impact of the specialty malt concentrates. Um, by all means, have a play around with uh, the concentrates. You can doze to taste or to visual color. Uh, but I would just say that we're talking about relatively low addition rates um, in the range of 0.2 to 1%. Uh, the sample packs that you have contain two 120 gram bottles, so there is plenty of material there to, to get creative and to conduct your own benchtop trials. Uh, and very lastly, uh, the taste mat, which contains the addition rates we're using here today, uh, should now be available in the chat. So let's get started. We've got uh, four glasses laid out here, which I've marked to measure out 150 ml uh, beer samples. I've got one for a control, followed by three variants. 
Um, I've weighed out two of the three products in advance, um, but I will do the first one for you in a couple of moments so you can see exactly what I'm doing. Um, the, the idea here is that by uh, using sample cups, we can add a small amount of the base beer to the sample to make a, a pre-dilution. Essentially what we're doing here is replicating what we would do in the brewery. Um, we typically advise that uh, the concentrates are added um, when the beer is subject to turbulent flow and this ensures that we get a good homogeneous mixing. Um, so as I say, by using the sample cups, adding a bit of beer, I can easily agitate um, the beer and the extract so it dissolves nicely and we get a good homogeneous sample. Um, so yeah, let's get started. We're, first of all, we are going to look at uh, CB3065. Um, now this product is 100% uh, caramel malt concentrate. Um, caramel malt uh, being a specialty malt which is produced uh, using a, a wet roasting uh, procedure. Now, it benefits from a, a longer uh, stewing phase followed by a short roasting cycle. The CB30 brings forward uh, the lovely golden hue, uh, the sweet caramel and toffee notes uh, that are inherent in the raw material. Uh, so I'm going to weigh out um, the CB30 and for this one we are using an addition rate of 1%, um, so that's one and a half grams uh, of product in 150 mils of beer. Uh, so if you are uh, following along at home then get your scales out and we'll weigh out some extract. You need to be fairly uh, delicate here as I say these are low addition rates. So there we go, that's 1.5 grams of the CB30. Uh, I'm also going to need some beer. Uh, so I'm going to pour out 150 mils for the control and 150 mils uh, for my first sample. Now I'm going to take a little bit of the base beer. I'm going to add it to the, the sample cup with the concentrate. So it enables me to give it a mix, just gently agitate the, the product and the, um, and, and the beer. And once we've got a good mix, which we have now, we can add it back to the base. And there we go. So adding the, the CB30 to the base beer. And I'm going to hold these up in front of this white background I have. Uh, to give you a bit of a visual. So here you can see um, that at the addition rate of 1%, um, we are increasing the color by around 3.5 EBC, uh, and we're bringing in um, a lovely golden hue, um, typical uh, of the, the caramel malt produced in the brew house. And on tasting, You should be detecting some of that lovely sweetness, um, the rounded caramel malt profile coming through and possibly some mild toffee notes. You're also hopefully picking up uh, increased body when comparing to the control uh, and a fuller mouthfeel. So with those attributes, the, the increased color, the golden hue, and the sweetness and, and the rounded caramel profile, we're taking the pale dagger uh, and giving it a real premium Pilsner feel. So I'll pop these down just now and I'll let you have a taste at home while I pour out some beer for uh, the next product. So again, 150 mils of base beer going into the glass here. So the next product we're going to look at is CB12065. Um, now this is a blend of caramel malt and dark crystal. So it's a lovely balance of the sweet caramel flavors coming from the caramel malt and the, the, the drier underlying complexity that you get from the, the dark crystal. Um, it also brings with it um, a lovely um, striking amber red tone. So let's make up our, our pre-dilution. So again, um, this one here, uh, the addition rate is lower. We're, we're at 0.5% weight vol, uh, 0.75 grams for 150 mils of beer. I'm gonna pour a small amount into the sample cup, give it a, a mix. Nicely mixed now, and we're gonna add that back to the base.
I'll hold that up in front of the white background again so you can get a bit of a visual. So here at this addition rate, 0.5% uh, weight vol, um, we're adding um, around eight EBC of color. And on tasting. This time um, you should be detecting obviously slightly less sweetness with, with the CB30. Um, the balance of the, uh, the, the caramel and the crystal gives you um, a very uh, complex profile. Uh, and again, um, increased body and fuller mouthfeel coming from the speciality malt. So I'll give you a second to have a taste at home. So that's CB120 and it's a blend of caramel and crystal malt. The next product we're going to look at is uh, RB365. Uh, now RB3 is actually a, a roast malt concentrate, uh, but it is indeed our uh, lightest color roast product. In its concentrated form, it is 3000 EBC uh, versus um, our darkest product, which is 17,000 EBC. So comparatively light in color. Um, this is an interesting application. What we're going to do here is use a very low addition rate. Um, we're using 0.2% weight vol, um, so 0.3 grams for the 150 ml beer sample. Um, and we are um, really aiming for uh, a lift in body and a fuller mouthfeel. We don't want to impart much sweetness, uh, and that's why RB3 is, is a great option for this application. So I'm going to mix our pre dilution here. Now, as I said, a nice uh, delicate, delicate adjustment here. Um, the RB3, if you see against the white background there, has increased the color by around six EBC. So we're giving the pale lager um, a, more of a, a premium appearance. And on tasting, as I said here, it's not about flavor. It's more about enhancing and boosting body and mouthfeel. In place of the sweetness that you will have detected with the, the, the crystals, uh, you may um, pick up some very subtle nutty or roasted profile. Um, but what I hope you will um, pick up is the, the increased body and the fuller mouthfeel, again, giving the perception of this being a premium product. So finishing off there with something a little bit different, but I hope um, that you found that, that interesting with that product. It gives us quite a lot of flexibility, and I should add that it's, um, it's a good option for um, no and low alcohol beers as well, the RB3. So that concludes the tasting. I hope you found it interesting uh, and have managed to uh, take some useful information from it. Um, we would, of course, be uh, delighted to um, get your feedback and field any questions that you may have following the webinar. If you don't have a direct contact with a member of the team here, you can reach us through the website, puremalt.com. Um, there is a, a live chat function where you can ask a question, and there are also uh, Let's Talk forms at the bottom of each product page. Um, we do also have a dedicated team of sales managers here um, who would be very happy to uh, guide and support with any upcoming or pending projects that you may have. So thanks again for joining and I'll pass you back over to Ross in the studio. Thanks Simon for the excellent showcase. Um, I hope that you have taken some inspiration uh, from the content that we've presented today and that it is helpful uh, to some of you for the projects that you have uh, or are working on at this time. As Simon mentioned, uh, all of today's webinar has been recorded and will be distributed uh, as a follow-up uh, to, to, to the session today. Um, and we will also distribute all the questions and answers uh, that have, have materialized over the course of, of the half hour. I would like to uh, share with you some details on our next episode, which is on blondes, box and bitters. Uh, my colleague Ron Dejansky uh, will be presenting uh, different techniques available to brewers in creating unique uh, blonde, bock and bitter style beers. Uh, this will also incorporate uh, a live tasting again with Simon um, presenting from uh, a different location uh, from our brewery here in Haddington. So finally, it leaves me to thank you uh, for joining today's webinar and for tuning in uh, to listen to our content. We hope that you find it useful and we hope that you will join uh, future webinars with the Pure Malt TV team. Have a very lovely day and uh, goodbye now.